This is the ultimate map of today. The product of a technology that can now reveal as never before the visible and the invisible shape of the world. It all began 150 years ago. In the mid-19th century, our picture of the world was transformed by a great leap forward and upward. Lighter than air, this fragile envelope of gas set free the human eye. The innovator was the French photographer Nadar. The flights of Nadar in 1858 were very important because with two new technologies, he could for the first time see the Earth from above in the air to the ground using the technology of uh, gas ballooning and the technology of uh, photography. In the words of the cartoonist Henri Daumier, Nadar raised photography to the height of art. Certainly, his achievement became an overnight sensation. Map makers had often imagined the bird's eye view. Venice in 1500, China in the 17th century, or Japan in the 19th. Nadar's photographs made their dream come true. The aerial camera was the first stage in a process which would create an entirely new perspective on the world, the view from above. Now map makers could verify their work, old or new, as the landscape unfurled beneath. And it was so much quicker. In 1885, it was estimated that only 12% of the world had been accurately charted. Within a century, not only would the whole surface of the Earth be mapped, but also what lay hidden and invisible beneath. Nadar's innovations were soon turned to practical use. In the American Civil War, the Union flew a balloon over the Confederacy for reconnaissance. Next, the military experimented with a camera mounted on a kite, photographing their parade ground. This shot was taken in 1897 from a rocket designed by Alfred Nobel, founder of the Nobel Prize. In Germany, Pigeon Post took on a new dimension with this photograph of the castle at Kronberg. By the time the First World War broke out, a new camera platform had been developed far faster and more maneuverable. Intrepid military photographers such as Sergeant Charles Allot of the French army risked their lives to bring back the latest pictures as the battle raged back and forth. His diary. September the 7th, 1915, we set off, gaining heights south of Verdun. Clear skies, patches of postcard color below. I check my map to work out where we are. We're coming up to fren en verve the pilot looks around nervously for German planes. We cross the French lines. Now we're over the German trenches. Can they see us? I hope not. I take a shot. And another. 
At the third, I hear a strange bang. Suddenly, there are explosions all around us. Another 50 meters and a very near miss. Despite the turbulence, the camera holds firm. I need two more shots to finish the job. Surprisingly enough, Sergeant Allo survived. Les Allemands se trouvaient de ce côté-là, les Français de ce côté-là, dans cette côte-là. D'ailleurs, euh, vous avez un endroit là qui s'appelle le ravin de l'amour. Et là, c'était de la boue, de la glu. Il y en a même, quand ils étaient enlisés là-dedans, ils n'arrivaient pas à s'en sortir. Et il y arrivait bien souvent que sur le nombre des troupes qui descendaient, ils ont voir aux environs de 300 hommes, même 400 hommes, environ, ouais. Parfois, il n'y en a remonté en repos qu'une douzaine. These scars were inflicted on the landscape by enemy shells. Photographed by Allo in 1917, they were then rendered into a map. The battleground changed, but the purpose remained the same provide accurate, up-to-the-minute mapping of the war's destructive progress. And there was an unforeseen bonus for posterity. When Allo photographed Douaumont Fort, he captured on film the tiny village in the background, the first and last aerial record. Duomont was not the only village to be obliterated. This is now the main street of nearby Fleury. In 1914, a flourishing community of church, cafe and farms. In 1916, Fleury had experienced its share of the shelling, and by the war's end, Fleury had been, as the French say, anéanti, reduced to nothing. While Europe was in the throes of World War I, American map makers were taming the Wild West, and they still are, but by helicopter. Day after day, a pair of surveyors take off into a rugged and remote quarter of Nevada. Their purpose? to check the accuracy and scale of the original maps made in those laborious days by measuring the terrain into one-mile square sections and marking the corners with a benchmark or corner section. Furnished today with a pair of aerial photographs, a stereo viewer and a tape measure, Corky Swanson and Ben Rush verify the work of their predecessors. Still looks good. Yep. Stamping's good and everything. Yeah, now this is the... Uh original corner that was put in in 1916. It's a witness corner. Take a look and see if you can pinhole it. Now I'm looking for the, that bush over there, looking for it on the photographs. And once I find it, then I just pinhole it on the, uh, on the photo. You can pick out the bushes, the rocks, Every little detail down there that's on the ground. There we got that. Now all we have to do is measure a distance from the corner to that bush. Corky and Ben are today's equivalent of the ancient Greek scientists or the British surveyors of India. There is almost a quaintness in the continuity both of purpose and the tools of their trade. Hmm. 20 feet. That's 20 right. feet exactly? Mm -hmm. Due east. Okay. Yeah. Well, that takes care of this one, Ben. Let's uh, 
go over the helicopter and organize and, and uh, see where we need to go next. Well, the next one's going to be up on top of the up ridge. On top, up there. Huh? Photographic surveys by aeroplane became the norm, used by governments all over the world to map their lands. But since the earliest days, there has often been a secondary purpose, to exploit the Earth's resources, minerals, water, and in the vast expanses of 1930s Persia, oil. In searching for a new oil field, likely country is examined for indications of oil-bearing strata that may exist below. Photographs are taken from the air in such a way that each overlaps the previous one by 60% of its area. After being developed and printed, the photographs are laid on a table in the mosaic room, the prints overlapping so that common details coincide. In this way, a complete photographic map is built up. A few years earlier, a less commercial but far grander flight was planned to Mount Everest. House of visibility. 17,000 as a haze and uh, no clouds. You prepared to go, Clyde, sir? I am indeed. And you, McIntyre? Well, rather, let's get on with it. They brought back the first aerial footage of the highest mountain in the world. Over 200 men and women have stood on the summit. Yet a definitive map of the roof of the Himalayas has only recently been achieved. It's a map of using the most detailed, most accurate, sophisticated equipment that's available today in mapping an area of the world. We used uh, stereo photography uh, from the space uh, shuttle Columbia and then we used a Learjet to give us aerial photos of the area to give accurate detail of the cover. Boulders, moraines, uh, glaciers in great detail. So this map took a considerable amount of time to put together. It's uh, done in the Swiss uh, mountain relief style, and I think it's one of the most beautiful maps that we've ever done. Balloons, biplanes, and now satellites. Rockets have displaced envelopes of gas, and the camera has become an electronic digital scanner recording beyond the wavelengths visible to the human eye. Pseudo lifelike color can be created, as here, with development in Brazil or in the Nile Delta. But color is essentially used to highlight a particular feature, hot lava flow from an erupting Mount St. Helens of phytoplankton in the Atlantic Ocean. A satellite can even detect signs of that alluring element which drew the pioneers and conquistadors across the world hundreds of years ago in their gamble for gold. Of course, you know, the, the state of Nevada is well known as a gambling state. And the fact is, is that we participate in another form of gambling, which is a very extreme form of gambling, I, in my view, and that is gold mining. The levels of investment are, are very, very large. Well, between 20 and $40 million, actually, per mine. So that uh, there are many of them that are brought online that are uh, dismal failures. And there are others that, for the stroke of good fortune, end to be economic successes. And the, the fact is you don't know when you start out. So we look at individual known gold occurrences and then from those known gold occurrences, extrapolate outward into areas that aren't very well understood, but look for the same type of, of uh, spectral signature, if you will, that are displayed here. And we can do all sorts of manipulations with a computer and an image processor and, uh, and find other areas that are likely to contain gold. So therefore, when we look at zones, yellow streaks, which are not themselves gold zones, but rather somewhere inside may be gold zones that with a structural interpretation can zero us in on the targets that we need to, need to look at in the field and, and prospect in the field.
despite the fact that gold exploration technology has reached the space age with the use of satellites, there's still a need for the geologists in the field. Well, gold is a naturally occurring element in the Earth's crust, and the pursuit of it has caused quite a gold rush here in Nevada in recent years. I'm looking for minerals in the rock that might indicate the, president, or the presence of gold in this environment. I'm looking for quartz or clays or iron staining. These minerals are commonly found near the types of large tonnage, low grade gold deposits that we're exploring for here in Nevada. From each ton of excavated earth and rock, only one to two grams of gold will eventually emerge. What lies hidden below the Earth's surface is a problem shared by gold diggers and map makers alike. Satellites and photographs can only see superficial signs. To look beneath, different technologies would be needed. Almost three quarters of the world's surface is water. Since sailors first ventured into that element, they have told tales more myth than truth of sirens luring them to a watery grave and mysterious monsters lurking in oceans immeasurably deep. Amongst those who set about separating fact from fiction was Prince Albert I of Monaco. As a monument to his life's work, he built this world-famous museum for posterity. The princes of Monaco have always taken a keen interest in, in the Mediterranean and in the study of the seas, but I think my great-great-grandfather, Prince Albert I, was the first one to really uh, take a scientific approach to it. In his day, very little was known about, about the seas and about the ocean floors, about currents, about animal life. Um, and, and he really initiated a, a lot of the programs we now know concerning ocean studies. Between the 1880s and 1915, Prince Albert mounted several expeditions, his ships purpose-built for oceanographic research. In 1904, he produced a 24-sheet world bathymetric chart, or depth map. Updated versions, still using the convention, the deeper the blue, the deeper the ocean, are used today. But they don't tell you what the ocean floor looks like. Of course, people don't realize uh, that some of the highest mountains and some of the deepest valleys lie on our ocean floors. And my great-great-grandfather was, was one of the first scientists to ever uh, discover these. And he was indeed one of the first to uh, discover the great uh, Mid-Atlantic Ridge. Part of a submerged 40,000-mile volcanic mountain range which encircles the world, the Mid-Atlantic Ridge had first been mooted in the 1850s. But another century was to pass before its full significance was appreciated, when scientists confirmed that it is here that the cracks in the Earth's crust are filled as the continents drift apart. Driven by this discovery, the American oceanographers Bruce Hazen and Mary Tharp transformed our view of the ocean floor. They asked not how deep is the water, but how high is the land. Their map of a world drained of its oceans became a milestone. This is our world ocean floor. It uh, is the culmination of uh, all of my professional life with Dr. Hazen. It didn't just happen because it, this was done in different stages as we got learned more about it and also as we got more data. The Elisha Kane also carries a most precious cargo in the oceanographers who have come aboard. 
scenting the possibilities of finding new knowledge, knowledge hard to come by in this forbidding world of the ocean. Dr. Bruce Heason, leading authority on the theories of continental drift, a Navy consultant and faculty member of Columbia University. He is the chief scientist aboard. Marie Tharp, also of Columbia University, discoverer of the existence of the rift, which cuts directly through the Mid-Atlantic Ridge, a rift deeper than the Colorado Canyon. Here is our rift valley, and it's midway between South America and Africa. This was a very important map when it came out in 1961, because it sort of pointed out the fact that there might be something to this theory of continental drift, because not only now the continents match up each other, but we found this deep valley right in the middle, which would show where they had pulled apart. Ms. Tharp noticed these, this, on her profiles, noticed this deep valley along the axis of the ridge and uh, connected it up. And indeed, one of the most important discoveries that's been made in the topography of the ocean since the war. Uh, let's see, I had discovered the Rift Valley in 1952. It took eight months to convince Bruce it was really there. Very skeptical man. He didn't publish on it or announce it until 1956. Then I spent the next 20 or 30 years mapping the ocean in much more detail as we got more soundings. And the first sound source that was used for that method was half-pound charges of TNT, which were thrown overboard from a ship underway at full speed. And the return of these sounds uh, was recorded on the ship on the graph. And then that would give you the, a picture of the bottom and the layers and the depth to the rock underneath. Uh, it, it worked out fine for just about a million miles that they used it, and we only had one fatality when the TNT blew up in the guy's hands and blew him in part, and there was a hasty burial at sea. Recent computer animation can now render Tharp's ocean floor map in 3D and on the move. Today, the latest technology in mapping by sound is a British invention called Gloria. Towed behind a ship and beeping non-stop, Gloria produces a sonograph of the sea floor, a continuous sound picture in 40-mile wide strips. Gloria even shows underwater rivers on the seabed. Again aided by computer, this is Gloria's vision of the triple junction off the coast of Madagascar. So, if sound waves could produce pictures of the ocean floor, could they do the same where the water was frozen? The ice cap of Antarctica would be the next frontier in the map maker's search for pictures of the invisible. Due to its extreme climate, Antarctica has, until quite recently, been a mystery, the subject of conjecture even pure fantasy, terra incognita. Captain Cook came close in 1773, but he never sighted Antarctica, let alone made a landfall. Even in the 20th century, despite Amundsen, Scott, and the Antarctic explorers, knowledge remained sketchy. And really that didn't change until we got to the period of the Second World War. We were still putting little bits of jigsaw of the coast together. But thereafter, there was a rapid transformation. Technology had exploded, radio communications, overland transport as a virtue of the, of the Second World War. And those were then fed into the Antarctic. And with, for instance, Operation High Jump, a massive American surveying expedition to the Antarctic, we started to get aerial photography and the ability to cover large areas of Antarctica for topographic mapping purposes. The aerial photographic survey went only so far. The fundamental problem was, what lay beneath the ice? The landmark, I guess, really came in the mid to late 1960s, when it was discovered again through institutions in Cambridge 
that radar could be used to penetrate the ice sheet and also to map the surface of the visible part of Antarctica. And with American help, uh, long-range airborne forays were made into the Antarctic right through the 1970s. And this was a marvellous period because we suddenly discovered that Antarctica really had two geographies. There was that which we could see with the eye, the huge expanse, the interminable plateau of ice that covers this continent almost twice the size of Australia. But beneath the ice is the rock platform, that sort of immutable land surface, which is the second geography. And the radar systems were able to penetrate the ice and map the surface and this hidden landscape. And so we ended up with maps that depicted you know, the rolling contours of the ice sheet and then the rugged mountains and basins, uh, a whole continental uh, landscape buried beneath the ice sheet. In places, the ice is three miles thick, and it's a shifting geography, constantly expanding and contracting. It's mapped today by polar satellite. But there is a curious conundrum in the story of Antarctic mapping. This is Antarctica as we know it today. But turn it upside down and compare it with Antarctica as drawn by Orontius Phineas in 1531, with South America at the bottom. When you look at the Orontius map, it was compiled with no knowledge whatsoever of the landmass around the South Pole. And yet, we have a circular landmass, we have two parts, a larger and a smaller part, we have two embayments, one very pronounced where the Ross Sea is today, and we have mountains shown on the map. Now these mountains aren't depicted in the centre of the continent or in a particular way. They're actually arranged around the margin and then up through the centre, which is exactly the way in which scattered outcrops and the Transantarctic Mountains, one of the major mountain chains of the world, straddles the Antarctic. It's really quite fascinating. I have no answers, it's a jolly good guess. Um, I just leave it for people to puzzle over. Shortly before Orontius made his inspired guess at the shape of Antarctica, the Portuguese virtually invented a map of Brazil, their stake in the new world. Successive maps exchanged charm for increasing accuracy. But the impenetrable rainforest continued to pose problems. In the late 1960s, the Brazilian dictatorship government desperately needed to develop the Amazon basin, both to absorb the millions flocking otherwise to the overcrowded cities and as a gesture of national endeavor. O presidente afirmou, não sei de tema que hoje mais exalte a imaginação dos moços e o tema de desenvolver a Amazônia. Nem sei que mais possa... Conventional aerial mapping faced major problems in Brazil. Not only its size, the same as Europe, but the frequent cloud cover and canopy of trees. The solution came with a technological breakthrough which had just been declassified by the United States. Side-looking airborne radar. The huge mapping project was named RADAM, from Radar and Amazon. So it's a piece of cake to, to choose a device which looks through the clouds and doesn't carry, care whether it's raining or whether it's night or whether any, anything else. It just, it just goes up and, and, and penetrates whatever hindrance would have stopped the photographs and gives you 24-hour service. We did a lot, of a lot of the radar mapping at night and uh, I say it makes no difference. The all-American technology filled a Caravelle jet. Not only a radar transmitter the length of the fuselage and its associated recorders, but film and video cameras, both still and movie, for cross-checking the radar images and a flight-controlled computer to keep the Caravelle on a straight path to and fro across the Amazon. 
usually we spend about 10 hours a day flying over the Amazon. During the, the flying time was not much to do because most of it was left to do the computer system in the caravel. So sometimes we are playing cards. <laughs> it was a quick turnaround back at base after each flight. A new tank of fuel, a check on the electronics and a change of crew, both pilots and technicians. The vital radar recordings then underwent a complex laboratory process to convert the blips into visible film strips. It has no, no sense of color in the eventual radar picture, but it has a very strong sense of form. If you will think of the lush beauty of fields, slightly rolling fields as seen just before sunset with a grazing light, you know how, mu how much form is given by the casting of shadows and by the inflections to the apparent darkness. The appearance of form is very much uh, the same accented appearance of form that you get from viewing in, in, the, in the evening sun. Compiling the mosaics was only the beginning. The whole area, over three million square miles, had to be spot checked. Field teams comprising specialists in different scientific skills did six week stints in the rainforest over a period of five years. Evaristo Tereso was in charge of one team for the last two years of the RADAM project. At the end of the, the day, all the people that are involved in search and error got together and discussed what we found during the day. And this was a classroom indeed because we are learning among ourselves. Uh, the geologist would teach about the, ge the geological aspects of the area and uh, the forest engineer were talk about the jungle. And uh, at the end of the day, we had a clear idea of the area. Nunca, in toda the history of Radan, Amazonia, alguém dormiu numa casa. Sempre em barraca. Em torno de 90 a 100 homens acampados na selva. A importância de uma pista para ser os helicópteros. Então, essa era a rotina do projeto. E nós criamos um mito no, na Amazonia. Nós trabalhamos de janeiro até 22 de dezembro com chuva ou sem chuva. Não tínhamos como mudar o clima amazônico, então tínhamos que adaptar ao clima amazônico. Esse é um projeto com chuva e sem chuva. Living day in, day out in the jungle camps was uncomfortable. But there were far more serious dangers. I think that about 53 persons died. Most of it by... Uh a plane crash, and uh, some uh, while they were descending a rope. To open up a, a place in the jungle, you need to, to get down through the trees. And sometimes those trees are 45 meters high, and that makes uh, very dangerous. But uh, the point is that uh, when you are young and we're doing a, a job that you love, then uh, no one thinks about crashes or danger. Então não foi como eu falei, quer dizer, dentro do espírito de corpo que tinha no projeto, a liderança e o espírito de equipe, qualquer fato que ocorria era superado em 24 horas. No Rio Negro, em Alpés, um helicóptero nosso caiu no rio no fim da tarde, num voo de um minuto de uma cabeceira da pista para outra. Caiu no Rio Negro, morreram nove. Todo mundo viu o helicóptero afundar e morreram os nove. No outro dia, todo mundo estava trabalhando como se nada tivesse ocorrido. Realmente foi um trabalho heróico. Disse o, o, o presidente Geisel, que esteve no projeto, que isso era um projeto, parecia uma guerra, só não tinha tiro. E realmente foi isso. Radam revealed unsuspected hills and valleys buried beneath the tree canopy. It defined the borders between jungle and plain, and even reversed one river's direction of flow. For the first time in history, the Amazon, hidden for so long, was on the map. Based as they were on radar, which looked through cloud and ground cover into the earth beneath, the Radam maps revealed more than features in the landscape. They charted potential, vegetation, soil types, mineral deposits. Due to their scale, they were only a rough guide, but they were enough. O 
Presidente Médici expressou sua confiança em que... Knowing little or nothing then of deforestation problems, President Médici saw only political problems solved. With each tree felled, a peasant farmer relocated. Not that the peasants had heard of Radam as they poured into the Amazon basin. They were simply allocated land by a government agency. While most got a few hundred acres for free, an actress and her husband from Sao Paulo bought 60,000 acres here for a cattle ranch. It was a serious investment, backed by thorough research. Na, na, eram 100 lotes de 2 mil hectares que estavam, ali, estavam sendo licitados. E mesmo dentro desses 2 mil, desses 100 lotes, é, alguns lotes eram de terra muito boa e alguns lotes a gente sobrevoa, nós vemos aqui de avião, sobrevoamos a área para a gente poder ver o tipo de vegetação e pela vegetação a gente mais ou menos escolher. E a partir dessa sobrevoada, nós sentamos com os mapas do Radam para poder ver o que, que o Radam dizia analiticamente com relação ao solo. Amazônia, ontem, página de folclore. Hoje, rumo e destinação dos brasileiros que dissipam a assombração do inferno verde com a disciplina do trabalho e preparam o amanhã com a fecunda semente da educação. Desbravei, porque aqui eu cheguei e fiz do nada. Essa minha fazenda, por exemplo, era mata virgem. Eu fiz tudo desde derrubada, plantio. Isso só me enriqueceu, quer dizer, me enriqueceu como ser humano. Eu acho que as pessoas que vêm para a Amazônia têm um tipo de experiência existencial que a gente não tem em outro lugar, entendeu? Porque a gente se desafia para determinados... Porque a gente aqui muda os valores. Os valores são completamente invertidos aqui, alternados, né? As the rainforests went up in smoke, the values of Radam, which had seemed such an heroic enterprise, would soon be called into question. A thousand years earlier, and over 2,000 miles to the northwest, a great civilization had flourished, the Mayans. They too burned their forests to provide an agricultural breadbasket for flourishing cities far larger than the London of those days. Now, only the greatest of those cities survive, such as Uxmal in the Yucatan Peninsula. Many smaller sites, archaeologists suspect, have been lost to the ever-encroaching jungle. To find them, the experts have laid down their spades and turned to radar. Well, archaeologists are fairly conservative. I mean, we, we you know, we live in the past, don't we? And <laughs> that kind of thing. But the point is that uh, I feel that we shouldn't uh, deny ourselves our natural advantages. I mean, after all, we live in an age in which technology is moving uh, forward very rapidly, and uh, anything, money's short, life is short. There are not very many of us archaeologists. There's an enormous amount of work to do in terms of finding out, you know, about Maya civilization or any other big complex culture like this. And the more we can make our work efficient by the means of technology as well as other means, uh, well, uh, the better. We at NASA Research Center near San Francisco are looking at Mayan ruins using satellite and aircraft data. However, satellite data doesn't really give you the, the resolution uh, that you need or the detail that you need to map those particular places. So we have taken the opportunity to fly our ER-2 aircraft down to the Yucatan. Well, you know, I mean, it's much cooler and, and uh, more comfortable tooling around in a four-engine jet at 24,000 feet rather than thrashing through the bush and, you know, uh, sweaty and, uh, you know, uh, all the bugs biting you and so on with mules. In our case, uh, we took about a, oh, 36,000 square kilometers. And uh, then we uh, put together a mosaic of these positive prints of the uh, images and uh, made essentially a map. And uh, we would come down to... Uh, the specific things that we thought we had found, a new site, for example. So what we're doing is looking at shadows of particular mounds of rubble. That's been one of the keys to trying to map some of the new areas, is we actually see shadows that shouldn't be there because there is no terrain other than old Mayan temples. To discover another Uxmal, even by radar or satellite, is hardly realistic. But to reveal smaller sites that build up a picture of a long-dead civilization, is every archaeologist's ambition. A dream, actually, of, of mine would be a complete radar survey, a complete inventory of all 
Maya sites uh, and be able to plot them, you know, on the on our maps, uh, correlate them with the with the terrain, the swamps, the rivers, the hills, and all that sort of thing, and uh, be able to uh, to lay out a complete inventory of all of these cities, towns, villages, hamlets, and so forth. Um, and uh, the, the the radar is the only thing that really gives us the potential of doing that. So Dick Adams' radar can help to map the past. But today's state-of-the-art maps, with the help of a computer, have moved into another dimension. Not only space, but time. They show what's actually going on in the world. This multicolored spaghetti is, in fact, animals on the move. The U.S. Geological Survey, in cooperation with the Fish and Wildlife Service, has done a study in the north central part of Alaska, looking at lands that are known for their petroleum and mineral resources, but looking at how the various types of animals are going to be affected by potential development. One of the things that we can do is collar different types of animals, such as polar bears, and see how their migration routes may be affected. What this system demonstrates, and dramatically, is that interference from man would threaten their way of life. Polar bears use and need a massive area. We're seeing them north of the state of Alaska in the Arctic Ocean. You know, we're looking at two different types of bears, some of them that stay in the Arctic area and some that are in the Beaufort Sea. One area of note here is that a female and her cub were collared to the west of Alaska and during the reporting period actually crossed the Bering Strait and went across Siberia. In this instance, the information on the polar bear's wanderings was recorded from space by satellite. So was the information which led to this. This is the map of the future, not on paper, but computer disk, not static, but moving, not in two dimensions, but three. This spectacular vision is, in fact, a map of the Los Angeles area. Its creator, Kevin Hussey, of NASA's Jet Propulsion Laboratory in Pasadena. Visualization is useful to scientists for several reasons. One being that it allows you to see the unseen. The human eye-brain channel is the best data assimilation and integration system ever created. The more information that you can give the scientist through his eyes, the better are the chances of understanding. I mean, when you see something, it's much easier to understand than when you look at a whole series of numbers or stacks of numbers, pages of numbers. A picture truly is worth a thousand words. In Hussey's magical maps, the artist is a supercomputer. We're looking at a 30 kilometer by 30 kilometer Landsat image of the Los Angeles area, actually the Pasadena area, centered on JPL. Uh, keep in mind this satellite is some 570 miles above the surface of the Earth. And what we're going to be doing is we're going to be showing how we take a, an image taken from 570 miles up and simulate a flight in a, quote, helicopter or aircraft. Now, this is JPL, this is where we are conducting this interview from, and this is the Rose Bowl inside of two golf courses that are next to Pasadena. This is downtown Pasadena. Okay, now, we also need, with the Landsat information, we need elevation at each one of these elements. Here you have mountains, you see bright red, and down where you have the plains, you don't see as much red. Okay, the elevation being registered or overlaid on the Landsat, or with the Landsat, we can now begin the process of, of picking our flight path. And that's what we'll do now. I'm going to elevate the position by rolling the cursor up and typing in elevation. And then I'm going to have my look angle down toward the ground. I change the pitch of the camera by typing in pitch. You do, have to, you do, know, you do have to know how to type 
and speak, actually, to do this. Um, all right, by looking at this, I can see that uh, the view I'm going to have is acceptable. And so I'm going to ask for a view to be rendered. What you're going to observe in the bottom portion of the screen is an actual, you're actually seeing the computer take the elevation and the Landsat and change the geometry so that it appears you're, oh, let's say 1,000 feet or so above this mountaintop looking down toward JPL. We also have the ability to check the location of our, of our camera over this flight path in relation to the topography. So I'm going to do a, a quick flight parameter uh, that will show exactly how, as you can see it, flying, quote, flying along the path. This is the path it would take. The blue line indicates where it is looking during this path. And at the bottom, you can see the elevation of the flight relative to the topography. This blue line down here is the ground elevation along this red line. OK. The idea here is, now that we've selected specific frames that are in the, the uh, will be in the movie, we need to turn the parameters over. In other words, we have to turn this information over to another piece of software that resides on the computer and let it run for, well, in the case of Valley of the Movie, it ran for five and a half days nonstop without processing anything else. A, a machine capable of four million instructions per second uh, ran five and a half days to produce the two minutes required for L.A. the Movie. That's the equivalent to a stack of pages about three and a half stories tall. I can't imagine a more interesting way to communicate the Earth to students who live in a video age. I mean, you give a student a map, and it's important they learn to read maps. However, if you want them to appreciate the landscape, what better way can there be of uh, exciting students about the Earth around them? Since making L.A. the movie, Hussey has taken on the whole world. It's a speedy journey, so here's a guided tour. We set off up the west coast of Africa past Europe, Britain, and Scandinavia, and over Russia. Then right across the North Atlantic and down below the clouds. We circumnavigate South America and up past the Andes pulling out over the North American continent. Then back across the Atlantic, through the Straits of Gibraltar and into the Mediterranean, and eventually over Turkey and the Southern Soviet Union for a view of the Himalayas from the north. Now we're over China and Japan. There is a scientific purpose to all this, a study of the crucial role played by clouds in the world's climate, a key tool in the understanding of our Earth as a living organism, and the risks to which we are now so carelessly subjecting it. This may be the map maker's final challenge.